see a Christian that gets sick and can't get free and ends up dying, does that mean that Jesus Christ wasn't able to heal him or didn't want to heal him or wasn't able to heal him? No. It doesn't. Maybe we got some growing to do. Maybe we had some double-mindedness that was getting in the way. Maybe we had uh, you know, some areas that, hey, I still need to grow a little bit. And I'll just say, that's the way, that's the way I, I, I take this. We've got, we see in Jesus what God's will is, right? He healed them all. He healed them all. He healed them all. We see what God's able to do. Sets them all free. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. It's not, it's not yes sometimes. If God's in a good mood. <coughs> do you understand? It's always yes. Today is always the day of salvation. So, as we're growing up into the image of Christ, I always try to tell people, listen, isn't it good news that Jesus gives us victory over all sin? Isn't it good news that Jesus gives us victory over all sickness and disease? So let's take it as good news. Let's don't take it as condemnation and an issue of theological debate. It's not. If your theology doesn't match what, what we see in Jesus, we need to change our theology. Can I just say that? He is the Word made flesh. He is the revelation of God. He is the Gospel. This is the Gospel we preach. We preach Him. We, pre we don't preach a, a, an it or a concept or a theory. We preach a person. That He is the good news. Do you understand? Amen. The good news that a man has now got God inside of him. And there, God's now got a man at the right hand. And this man has been received as us. As representing us. He represented us on the cross. He represented us at His living. He represents us in His resurrection. He represents us seated at the right hand of the Father. And so the Father now puts His life inside of us and says, Now, take His identity. Take His power. Take His life. Take it all as your own. So, you know, if we lose, if we lose somebody that's close to us, if we lose a friend or a you know, some people have lost children, things like that. Listen, I just say, we're at war, folks. We're at war. We don't take the condemnation onto ourselves. We don't put the condemnation on God. We don't put the condemnation on them. We say, listen, we're at war. Somebody got hurt. <coughs> so it wasn't us that killed them. But we don't say we didn't have we don't have the victory and we don't have the resources and the weapons that could have gotten the job done. We need to learn how to use them better. Okay? So I'm just saying, listen, don't be that impressed with me. I hope you're not. You're probably not. We're, we kind of were expecting a lot more actually. But you know, I, I, it, it's pretty cool just to say, I am what I am. There's others that are better out there, much better. But I'm excited. It's about Jesus. Uh, it's, it's about Jesus in us and what He can do. So I hope that, that does that answer your question? Probably more than the word than you wanted. Did I, did, yeah. did I, did I, did no, that was good. You just keep on keeping on. I mean, I was actually on a personal, personal level kind of because when I get visions, you know, sometimes I'm not bold enough to step up and say it. And then I see it happen and it could have helped somebody or something like yeah. that. But, the discernment, I'm still, right. growing, I'm still growing. Like as you started when you talked about Christian, you still saying, "Yeah." I'm still so I, yeah. so I lay hands on the sick and I tell them, "Listen, Jesus is able to heal them, Amen. and He lives in me." And Jesus said, "Believers will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover." And you know, two, you know, <coughs> three things can happen. One, they're instantaneously healed. Hey, we love those. Those, those make the highlight reel. Those get be the sermon illustrations, yeah. right? Then you can have somebody who receives some improvement, but it's not altogether gone. So then you can say, well, hey, let me just hit it again. Let me just, and I'm not starting over, I'm just adding two, adding two, adding two, adding two, right? Jesus had to pray for somebody twice. So if Jesus did, hey, I'll take it. You know, I'll just keep going until you get enough of Jesus, what Jesus has for you. The other thing is that somebody say, I, I don't feel any different. And I'll say, you know, sometimes you can tell how much grace do you have in that inter interaction. 
you can tell, well, it was a big step just for them to let you pray, and now, you know, uh, now they're like, you know, let me out of here sort of thing. Or is there just this willingness, like they were receptive, they might be receptive to you laying hands on them again and just say, okay, no, don't worry, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, I appreciate you letting me know. Right now, in Jesus' name, I command you, go. You know, just hit it again, right? Uh, or, you know, after probably two, three times, especially in public, um, you know, they, they're probably like, okay, well, I appreciate this. Please let me go on my way. Um, and then you just tell them. You say, listen, I, it's an honor to pray for you. Thank you for taking time. It's a big step of courage to let us pull a stranger. I just know that God loves you and that Jesus Christ is Lord. And believers lay hands on the sick and they will recover. This is what Jesus said. So I'm just believing God for changing your body. And when that happens, I just want you to remember that Jesus touched you and he loves you. You know, so maybe they go on with their day. Uh, let me tell you a story. There was a, uh, a, a, a buddy that he was a homeless guy that I had ministered to out of Madison uh, several times. He was kind of in and out of my life. And I ran into him uh, a little over a year ago at the state fair, or at a fair out in the mall parking lot. The state fair, which is kind of one of the, you know, parking lots, a uh, bunch of rides. And he had, um, he was an African-American man, light-skinned, but he was like this color of yellow, almost mustard. And he had this oxygen tank in his nose. And, and I said, Isaac, wow, you do not look good. And he said, oh, God, COPD, and I'm on hospice. And they don't expect for me to live for more than two months. And I said, well, that ain't right. And I have to put my hand on him and just, you know, just command the COPD to go, release life. I said, breathe deep, see if it's changed. <coughs> Man, don't worry. Right now, you know, and I hit it a couple times and just preached the gospel to him a little bit. Just told him, listen, Jesus Christ is Lord. He loves you. You, you know, I, is your faith in Jesus? He said, yeah, I know it is. You know, so I, you know, I had a chance, had a great to talk to him. And I said, listen, this COPD has to go. I believe that you're not going to die by this. It's got to leave you. And I said, and, and I didn't see him for a while until about a month ago. He was only supposed to live for two months. I saw him about a month ago. I was walking out of Walmart with my wife, and I saw this guy. I saw this cane. You know, I just saw this cane. After a while, you're, you just get trained. Like, cane goes, you know, you just go right after it. It's like a dog, you know. You know, you know when, I, when I see those walkers, you know, man, that's, that's like word of knowledge for dummies. You know, I like that. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, somebody needs help. You know, I like that. And so... I saw this guy sitting on the bench, and he had this cane sitting next to his lap. And I walked over, and I looked at him, and it was Isaac. And I said, Isaac. And then I saw he didn't have his oxygen tank. And I said, where's your oxygen tank? And he goes, don't need it no more. <laughs> wants you walking around with a cane? And he said, no, I don't suppose so. You think he can take care of that too? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, right now in Jesus' name, I command this back and hip, you be made completely whole. And I said, now stand up. And he stood up. And he said, hey, that, uh, that catch I always get when I stand up, it didn't happen this time. He said, it's not going to happen. And I said, walk around a little bit. And I could tell he kind of walked with this little side to side again. And I said, sit down for a second. And I checked his legs, and he had one leg that was a half inch short. A lot of times, people that have lower back hip problems, they have um, issues because something's happened that their whole skeletal system's gotten out of line. Sometimes people were born with something. Sometimes accidents have happened, and parts of bones have not been put back in, and things have been put back together. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. So, anyway, I don't understand it. Basically, there's a lot of options. So I just said, right now, in Jesus' name, and I actually said it was the wrong leg, you know, because it, I was, it was my right. So I said, in Jesus' name, right leg grow. Well, is thank God the Holy Spirit didn't listen to me. He just grew out his short leg, which was the left leg, it was in my right hand, and his short leg grew out a half inch. And he watched it. You know, and his eyes were like this big. And, and I said, Do you feel that? And he said, Yeah, and I saw it. And I said, do you do that? He said, only Jesus could do that. Yeah. And I said, well, get up and walk. 
and he got up and walked and he grabbed his cane just out of force of habit, you know. And I said, I don't think you need that anymore. And he started walking without his cane, picking up. And he said, hey, yeah, I don't need it. Started lifting up. Hey, I don't need this no more. I don't need this no more. And then all of a sudden, he's out in front of Walmart, and he's causing a little bit of a stir. And people are looking around like, you know, what's going on here? He said, I don't need this no more. Hey, Jesus just healed me. And, that's, and then it turned out, it was like Acts chapter 4, you know. It, the people going into the temple to worship, you know. And all of a sudden, there's a guy walking around. And I got an opportunity to talk to some people, to pray for some more people. And, uh, you know, with just a simple thing of paying attention to uh, a cane and being willing to, to, to just walk over to somebody and say, hey, what's going on with that? I can help you. I'd love to help you because Jesus loved his Lord and he loved you. So, what if, what if nothing would have happened? Hey. I don't believe I don't believe that nothing can happen. Do you understand that? It might not be apparent when when you're ministering, but do you understand that love never fails? Love cannot I mean something happened. I just loved you in Jesus' name. I cared enough to come over to you. Okay? Now that that's something right there. But I want to let you know that when you lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. That's God's word. So if you have enough faith to do the word, do you think God's got enough faithfulness to do His part of the word? Yeah. And so, listen, something's always happening. You are releasing life into them. You are releasing the life that overcomes sickness. You're putting medicine in them. Does a doctor worry when a patient walks out of the office having gotten the shot that cures their ill? Says, well, I don't feel any better. In fact, my, my arm hurts now. Get out of here, you'll be fine. You understand? You just put something in them that's going to cure them. Okay? Now listen, some of us have had, <coughs> had failure in the past. There's been some sort of failure. Well, I thought I did that. I did, I, I did, you know, I put my hand and I did believe it. And then something didn't happen. And, and then our mind gets all stirred up. Well, what about this? And we start making these, and, and we try to lock in. Our mind starts to get involved. Right? And we start to try to explain things. And, well, it don't always. You know, we make these faith statements that contradict the Word of God. And I never did get to this. Our emotions sometimes contradict the Word of God. Remember that I talked to you about yesterday that they ate off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and their eyes were open and they knew, hey, there's a knowledge, there's a way that seems right to men. But in the end, it leads to death. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. And He will make your path straight. So there's times where I'm like, you know what? I know the Holy Spirit was touching them. I could feel the power of God flow. I don't understand why they're not completely better yet. I've got a few hard cases that I'm just ministering to, and sometimes they get better and you think they're completely free and then four days later they're 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 back at the state that they were for a little while. You know, I've got some of these little battles that I'm dealing with. You understand? So I'm not tell I'm not trying to you don't hear a lot of healing ministries tell you about uh, the people that didn't walk across the stage. <laughs> so I hope you don't mind me saying it. Here's how I explain that. Jesus Christ is Lord, that He has absolute victory, and He's not done yet, so I ain't giving up. <laughs> and so I just encourage you, you don't give up. But what happens if they die? Well, they won if they're a believer. Okay, we lost the battle, but we've won the victory in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Okay? I, so that's the best I can say. I've got the right color jersey on. If I swing in this, I'm swinging. <laughs> I mean, don't give me that. I'll tell you, well, it didn't work that time. Well, pick again. <laughs> give me another one. I'm going to make you pay. Look out this one deep. Right there. <laughs> you know, get ready in the parking lot. <laughs> you understand? So we forget what lies behind. You know, it, I, I just 
just read a great illustration in one book. It said, listen, if, if I lay hands for somebody and they drop dead in front of me in my healing line, I'll step right over them to pray for the next person. Okay? Now that's almost a good illustration. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus said, right, you got it. Every place that tells you heal the sick and cast out demons, the very next phrase is raise the dead. It ain't over till we say it's over. If they drop dead, guess what? It ain't over yet. I got a solution for that too. It's the same solution as for healing. So as long as they're in front of you, we ain't lost. Jesus is the victor. And I never accept defeat. I just don't, because Jesus never did. Apparently, he never believed that defeat had a right to exist. So, okay, yes, ma'am. Yes. Well, I was going to say, you know, I, I questioned last night whether you have been coming up with my novel, because basically, this happened 20 months ago, and I already had two miracles on this. Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, my surgeons both said, you're probably going to lose your arm. You know, get ready for it. So they saved my arm. I couldn't believe that, number one. And then months later, I came back, and I could not believe that I had any use of it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And on each visit, they have just said, you are an absolute miracle. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank the Lord every day, and I continue praying. And, you know, it does get better, but my thing is, am I doing that correctly? It, I mean, am I doing everything right? Praying, you know, was I asking, I guess, was I asking too much for complete recovery? This may be as good as it gets, and I'm okay with that because I have my arm, and there are a lot of things that I can do, and that's what I'm trying to focus on. Is it selfish of me to ask for more? I guess that's my question. Is it selfish for you to want everything that Jesus purchased for you? Yeah. No. So I just, you know, if, if it would be selfish if God didn't want you to have it. <coughs> If, if Jesus gave his back up to whips and stripes so that you you could be free from, from torment and torture in your body, he gave his body over to that. You know, sometimes the, that that just flips things. You know, it's about it's not about big things or little things or too much. It said, you know what? Jesus Christ, the Lamb, is worthy. Yeah. He's worthy to receive the full reward of his suffering. He's worthy... For, for us to walk in holiness, he's worthy for us to walk in health. It's not about us. Hey, listen, you're his body, sweetheart. You're his body. So it's absolutely right. Keep pressing in for everything. For everything. Absolute victory. Everything. And then and, and just keep pressing in, you know? Just, just don't. For me, it's just not about getting discouraged. Because our circumstances don't tell us a thing about the gospel. Amen. Not a thing. Our circumstances don't tell us God loves us. The cross demonstrates once and for all that God loved us while we were still sinners. Amen. That's where it's all settled. What God has spoken to us in Christ, that is His Word to us. That's His revelation. And now it lives in us when we believe what we've heard in Christ. God loves me. He's not forsaken me. He's got complete victory over sickness, sin, and death. He's got complete victory over evil. He doesn't condemn me. God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world would be saved through Him. So if I want to be saved, hey, that's all He wants. That's what He gave Himself up for, to rescue me. I, I've had friends that have sometimes said, yeah, but I've done this over and over and over, and I know I shouldn't be. And it was like, and how do you feel about it? I feel bad. Yeah, you know why? Because your spirit is like, oh, that's not me. That's not me. Your spirit. If you re remember 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he who is joining himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Do you understand the reason you can grieve the Holy Spirit? 
is because the Holy Spirit never leaves you. Right. Even when you are doing your worst stuff, when you're a believer, the Holy Spirit won't leave you. He will just be inside of you going, ah! That's why the most miserable person on the face of this planet is not an unbeliever. It is a Christian who's trying to sin. <laughs> Do you understand that? <laughs> when you you know that your your relationship with God has truly changed when your relationship with sin has changed. It's the grace of God that teaches us to deny ungodliness. The grace of God's presence living inside of us. It teaches us. Deny that ungodly stuff. Don't go there. There's no life in it. There's only a passing pleasure. But the grief that you experience inside yourself is that is your true self crying out, I know better. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Thank you for being with me. You know what? In all of that grief, all of that sin. You know, Jesus died once and for all. But I need to explain to you, there is something very mystical about the fact that our sin somehow in that grief is transported back to His experience on the cross. And He, he pays for that. He pays for that. Do you understand? That it's very personal. It's interconnected. The same way that 2,000 years ago you were crucified with Christ and I was crucified with Christ. Somehow, it's almost as if God is like a riverbed and there's, there's this flow of time that's happening in the riverbed. And then all of a sudden, the riverbed somehow, while remaining the riverbed, steps into the river and becomes like a fish in the river. That's what Jesus did. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the one in whom all creation exists. And then He steps in while still remaining God. He steps into the human race and chooses to live only as a man, exercise none of His powers as divinity. So somehow He's in the river the same time that He is the riverbed. Okay? So He's just encapsulating this whole time-space thing. And in time, in the fullness of time, through the eternal Spirit, He offers Himself to God as a sacrifice. God was in Christ, not counting the sins of the world against them, but counting them against Christ. So you need to understand that for us, it looks like future. But for God, He just opened in a little chapter back. You know, the book of Revelation is already there. It, God's Spirit, He's already somehow. I mean, for us, we're sort of trapped here. You, don't, you understand that? But God reaches out, gathers up all humanity onto the cross in Christ. Something kind of helped me with this. You know, there's a verse that it talks about that in Adam we all sinned. Do you understand that biologically, physically, you were in, you and I were inside of Adam, inside of his loins? The seed that was inside of him made the seed that was inside of something, you know, begat, begat, begat. That's what you got all these begats in the Bible. Okay, it's like fast forward through history. Begat, 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 begat. Okay, now we want to, you know, start doing the movie. You know, that, but it wants to show you that there's a genetic flow here. And do you understand that when Jesus came into the world, it's God hit the reset button. And He said, no longer is Adam the head of the human race, so that when He fell, all humanity was inside of Him and fell also. The whole human race was uh, was sent away in Adam. You know, if I kill you on the electric chair, I kill everybody that's inside of me. You understand that? Okay, so if God, when Adam fell from God's presence and came under the sentence of condemnation and was exiled out of the presence of God, the whole human race was inside of him and went into exile. You were born in exile. You and I were born in exile in a sense. When Jesus Christ came into this world, 
And he was, he came into this world as the last Adam. The very last of, you, uh, of Adam's race, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Jesus Christ is the last Adam. Do you understand that as far as God's concerned, in 2 Corinthians it says, when he died, all died. God made Jesus Christ the new head of the human race. He made him the new head of the human race. And so everything that Jesus was doing, he was doing on behalf of this, this human race. And so when he died, Adam's race died. We all died as far as God's concerned. That's the end of that race. That's how you and I were crucified with Christ. God had put us inside of Christ. But that's how we were raised in Christ. <laughs> Because when he was raised, God said, hey, they're all justified. Everything that I required out of Adam's race, you know, uh, I'm going to show you this. Sec uh, do go to Galatians. I really like this. One of the biggest, one of the biggest temptations that you have as a born-again Christian is getting suckered into religion. And people will use the Bible to suffer you into religion. Let me explain religion for you. Religion is you have to do this or God's going to be upset at you. Or God's, God's not going to like you. And so instead of t talking to you, uh, they put a law and an expectation in between you and God. Right? Instead of saying, no, you know what? There's no law and expectation in between you and God. God's actually removed the between. There's nothing between you and Him. He's actually put everything that He wants already inside of you. And you're already completely pleasing to Him. Now, He just wants you to recognize that and to live by what He's given you. That's different. Religion's always saying, try, 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 attain, 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 maintain, maintain, maintain. And God's already, God's always saying in Christ, it's finished. It's finished. It's done. It's done. So let me tell you this. Let me tell you the story just a little bit. Uh, the gospel went to the Gentiles. Jews didn't typically eat with Gentiles. You know why? Because they had all these religious laws about what they could and couldn't eat. Gentiles don't care. They don't make kosher food in their homes. Okay, so Paul goes and preaches the gospel. He says, God came and he visited the earth. He lived in Jesus Christ. He totally overcame sin. He overcame sickness. He overcame death. He rose from the dead in time, space, and history. God has made him Lord of all. Now, repent of all your mindsets that God's far away, that God's this and God's that. God has revealed himself clearly in Jesus Christ. Give up your idols. Give up your own way of living. And come now to receive the life that God wants you to have. He's come to dwell inside of you. Bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll forgive you of all your sins and give you the life of God dwelling inside of you. And you get to enjoy being a son in the sun. You get to enjoy the Son's spirit as your life. That's good news. And he left and he gave them that. A life in Jesus Christ, enjoying fellowship with God, just enjoying being loved with this love they never deserved. And loving one another with that love that they never, that you don't deserve. God, our Father, and we're one big family. And then somebody came up from Jerusalem and said, yeah, well, Paul must have been a man pleaser because he didn't teach you about all these dietary laws that you're supposed to be following. He didn't teach you about these feasts that you're supposed to be keeping. He didn't teach you you're supposed to have these little capsules and your little curly sideburns and a box on your forehead. And he didn't teach you all. I mean, literally, I mean, if you're going to keep the law, don't, let's just don't get religious and pick and choose, okay? It's a whole system. One of those things is tithing. You understand? But that was part of this whole system. And this is what happened is that God, uh, they, they basically said, listen, all we've got, all Paul told us about is relating to God by the grace that he's given us in Christ, standing in Christ and giving, receiving, loving, blessing, with, and that's just what we do. Well, some people came up from James. Peter came up, and he's having a good time. He's eating pork sandwiches and having great fellowship. 
And some people came up from James and said, what are you doing eating with these Gentiles? And then Barnabas started getting pressured into it. And Paul said, listen, let me tell you why I can eat with Gentiles. He got right in Peter's face and he said, how, do you understand that he's saying not only are we justified, he's saying we're justified in Jesus Christ, but then we stand there. We don't ever move from there. Some people say, yeah, you get justified, but then you've got to get sanctified. And they'll start, yeah, but, and they'll start, like, sanctification is something that you do. But do you understand in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul is fighting and saying the reason that we don't have to keep all those rules now is because nevertheless knowing that a man is not justified by works of law but through faith in Jesus Christ even we have believed in Jesus Christ so we may be justified by faith in Jesus Christ not works of law since through works of the law no flesh will be justified do you understand that? so he's saying the reason I can eat a pork sandwich with my Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ is because I'm justified through faith in Jesus Christ and not all those works of the law. He completely made me just in the sight of God. Everything that Jesus did. Now I live by the Spirit. I live by the Spirit of God that He's put in me. Now, look at this. Verse 19. For through the law I died to... It doesn't say the law, it says law. I died to law as a system of relating to God. Do you understand that we don't have a system through which we relate to God? A system of expectations, a system of rules. Not Christian rules, not Buddhist rules, not... We relate to God through Jesus Christ, through faith in Him. Through law, we died to law. We died to that whole mindset of a system through which we relate to God. Of I keep these standards of expectation and I relate to God through them. So if I meet them, hey... Good, I'm accepted. If I don't meet them, I'm rejected. Through law, I died to law. You know what law can tell you? It can tell you where you failed. That's what law can tell you. It can tell you where you failed. Alright? And, guess what else it can do? It can pronounce the sentence upon you. So through law, I died to law. You know what law did? It pronounced the death sentence on me. So you know what I did? I just gave the law what I wanted. Okay. I'm dead. Done. <laughs> you, you know what? I murder somebody. You do it. You, you execute me. I'm dead on the electric chair. They pronounce me dead. I get up and walk away. There's nothing they can do. It. I, I paid my death. I'm done with that. I'm gone, baby. <laughs> you understand? They don't. You know how many? You know how many stop signs they have in cemeteries? None. None. You know why? People are dying to get in. Because yeah, they're dying to get in. But once they get in, they're dead. Dead people, there's no laws for them. The law's done with them. Do you understand that that is our relationship to law as a system? But it doesn't make us lawless. Look at the last part of the verse. I've died to the law, or I've died to law. Why? So that I might live to God. See, now I live in direct relationship with God. I live in His presence. In Romans chapter 6, it says, Knowing that you died with Christ, you all lost to live with Christ. Therefore, present yourself to God as those alive from the dead. Wow. Do you? How do you present yourself to God? You present yourself to God alive from the dead, do you? Hey, God, here I am, your resurrected, glorious Son. I mean, I'm not flipping about that. I'm enjoying God. Do you understand? You have made me glorious. You glorified me. In, in Romans chapter 8, it says, Those he foreknew, he predestined, he justified, he called, and he not will glorify. He's already glorified you. Do you understand that he's taken you, see that you glorified you in Jesus Christ? Do you present yourself to God as one who's already died on the other side of death, raised up with Christ in him? That's how I present myself to God. That's how you ought to present yourself to God. That's what God's Word. And every time you have something try to back you down, you just say, well, this is God's idea. <laughs> I don't feel raised. Yeah, I mean, Listen, we, we have a problem 
and it's this. And I've gone, I've got run right to it, so this, I'm going to get it. Darn. We have a problem is that we cancel out the gospel with our feelings. We cancel out the gospel with our experience. We do it by this. We say, well, I know I'm supposed to present myself to God, and He tells me that I'm accepted and I'm beloved, but I don't feel loved, or I don't. Uh, so when you say the word but, that means forget everything I just said. Yeah. <laughs> If I say, I'd really love to give you $50, I know you really need it, and you're a sweet girl, and uh, my heart's really, really moved to do that. But <laughs> as soon as I say that, that means you ain't getting that 50 bucks. <laughs> you understand? Okay. We need to learn, instead of canceling out the gospel with our feelings, with our thoughts, with our past, with our own experience in this world, we need to learn to cancel out everything else with the gospel. Amen. I don't feel very loved right now. I don't feel holy after what I've done. But I thank you, Father, that my holiness is not by what I've done, but by Jesus Christ. Amen. And that you are transforming me. And I do confess my sin. And I thank you that the blood of Christ cleanses me from all sin. And that I'm completely righteous. And that justice is not against me, but for me. Because justice is that Jesus Christ gets the full reward of His suffering. He suffered and died for me while I was still a sinner. And I thank You that I'm no longer a sinner. Because You've changed my nature. You've taken the heart of stone out of me. You've given me a... you hear how good I can cancel out the, the feelings with the Word, with, with the Gospel? Isn't that good? And so, listen. Our problem is our butts. Our, we, got, we got way too many butts in the church. <laughs> But, but a butt can be a very powerful thing, though, if you get your butt on the right side. And so we just need to turn our butts around, and we'll be okay. You see what I mean? We need to get the gospel on the right side of the butt. Say what you said. Talk to God about your past. Talk to God about your experience. Talk to God about your feelings. But then you just put a big old but God said. But Jesus says what Jesus is, what I know I am. Do you understand? So we get our butts on the right side, and it allows the gospel to transform us. Instead of us canceling out the gospel and its power for salvation by our experience. When we cancel out our, our the gospel with our experience, we slow down our transformation because we're really just reaffirming our experience and we're, we're, we're reinstating that. We're making sure that that's all that's going to happen in my life. Peter could have said, Lord, you told me to come to you, but... And he'd have never taken a step out of that boat. He could have started talking to Jesus about foolishness and well, we got to be practical here and all this kind of stuff. Well, why don't you just come here? I, you, you know, he could have said a lot of things. But he just said simply this, Jesus, if that's you, you tell me to come to you. Jesus said, come. And Peter stepped out on the authority of Jesus' word, knowing that when I, when I step forward to obey, that Jesus supplies the power to fulfill everything that he's commanded me to do. He's commanded us to heal the sick. So we can step out. <coughs> just. He just got, the Lord just got me all excited when he talked about the short leg. Yes. You got a short leg? I definitely do. Well, cool. and I like it. Yeah, let's just take it. It's nice and square. The chair. It's like oh, you're pretty out. sits your back. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Father, thank you right now for growing out this leg. Thank you for, for the authority of Jesus. Right now, in Jesus' name, short leg, I command you, in Jesus' name, you grow. Right now, you be made whole. Right now, thank you, Lord. There it goes, right there. Wow, look at that. Look at that. They're both growing. <laughs> They're both growing. You're getting taller. Holy smokes.